Hello, welcome to another episode of History Hack. We have a returning guest today, a third time returning guest, only because he has some incredibly interesting things to say. He doesn't need an introduction. It is the fabulous Colin Fisher. Hello, Colin. How are you doing? Hello, Alina. I'm very well, thank you. Very well. We are talking about something that I'm really, really interested in, and it's it's to do with a painting, but there's more to it than this very specific painting. I'm not going to say any more because hopefully we will talk a little bit more about it uh, towards the end. But we're going to be talking about Guernica. But first of all, can you set the scene for us? What was the situation like in Spain at that time? So we're talking about spring 1937. And when the last time I was on here talking about the defence of Madrid, it's a very, very different world. Uh, basically, Madrid has survived. It's held. Uh, that's that's kind of the sort of uh, the, the the elephant in the room. You can't ignore that. That all of Franco's plans depended on a relatively quick victory, and then follow up with this, with the social cleansing and purification of Spain. So he hasn't done it, and he's tried frontally. He's tried flanking. He's tried besieging. He's used his best shock troops from North Africa. And Madrid has held. On the other hand, down in the south, along the coast in Andalusia, he's had a lot much, uh, a lot more success, all the way up to Malaga, and he is striking further east along there. What we'll be talking about later on will be the further development of the campaign up in the north, which relates very much to uh, the bombing of Guernica. Uh, but at the moment, all eyes are really actually on the south, and what's coming out is bad. His victories are easy, are easy, his victories are quick, and in the case of the capture of Malaga, have led to large-scale massacres. Uh, what do we see if we go to the Republican side? Well, they feel more confident. Madrid has held out. Yes, there is rationing for sugar. Yes, there is even, even rationing for, for bread. But Soviet military supplies are arriving in large numbers, plus their military advisors. So it's not just the hardware that's arriving, but the actual know-how to use it in Spain. So I think they're feeling, well, all we have to do now is defend and then start to pick our counterattacks because Franco cannot rely on mass reserves on his part to make a, 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 a difference in the military sense. We've also got the international brigades. International brigades have come from not just all over Europe, but from all over the world, and you basically find them in almost all the fronts now. They're coming in mainly through Alicante, uh, down to the south of Valencia, uh, and they are fighting, as they have done, very much in Madrid, Germans, French and Poles, uh, above all, but we've also had the British uh, international brigadiers taking their part in the Battle of Karama uh, and so on. So they're playing a part and the Spanish people feel heartened and their morale is, is high. We've also got on the international scale, we've got the, kind of the, the, the non-intervention committee. So very much pushed by uh, British diplomats that the sort of facade is that no no one's going to interfere in this conflict. Now, it's quite clearly, this is, as I said before, nothing than a facade. It's a lie. Uh, Italy is up to its necks. So is, so is Germany. Uh, France wanted to help, but was, shall we say, persuaded by Britain not to, thinking about its long-term commitments. Uh, Russia is, is, is there as well. But the non-intervention committee, which is going to be largely backed up by the presence of the Royal Navy in the, in, in the Med and in the north of Spain as well, has this fiction that it's going to be an internal conflict, which is not going to pull the rest of Europe or the world into a new war. And then the final thing, Franco starting to move his forces northwards. He's got plans for there. And very importantly, the Condor Legion is moving some squadrons to its airfields in the north of Spain. So hopefully that gives you some idea of where we are in spring of 1937. The cold winter has, has been got through. Uh, the lines are holding. Supplies are being built up. But 
there's something going on in the north of Spain. So we are going to talk about this town. First of all, before we do get to that stage, because we know what's coming, but before we get to that, tell us about Guernica, where it is, and its population at the time. Well, uh, I mean, for me, because I live in Spain, my pronunciation, it makes no difference. I'll, I'll, I'll be saying Guernica throughout the podcast. But it's fine. Guernica, I'm doing Guernica. The- I'm it's doing the typical British thing. It's fine. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> I, I may so, pick it up a little bit later. <laughs> I, and I'm being the typically British and apologising <laughs> for doing what I do as well. Uh, so its full name is Guernica Lumo. Uh, it's located in the Basque country, what would be called Euskadi in, in Basque itself. Uh, it has got Roman remains, so there have been people living there certainly since the first or second century after Christ. Uh, However, the town itself uh, is built uh, or established in the 14th century, the 1330s, by the Count of uh, Bithkaya. So it starts from scratch, essentially. It's not far from Bilbao, which people might know from the Guggenheim Museum. Uh, It's only about 20 kilometres, about 12 miles, so it's very close. It is set in the most beautiful hilly countryside. Uh, the north of Spain can be fearsomely cold. The weather up there can be famously fierce. But in that area, it tends to be more the mild Atlantic weather which they get, which leads to extremely fertile crops up there, very fertile uh, farmland. Uh, it's a largely rural existence, although Guernica, by the time we get to the 19th century, actually uh, enjoys what you could say its own mini industrial revolution. It actually becomes an important centre of the Spanish small arms trade. I think it's the Astra pistol, which was a standard issue here in Spain for the Spanish armed forces. Uh, it's, it's made there. Uh, so you've got this surrounding land, which is largely fertile. You have a, a river running through the valley. Uh, You've got the town of Guernica on the banks of the river Guernica and stretching from the river down in the valley Oca and it stretches up towards the church of uh, the Virgin Mary, uh, sorry, uh, the church of St. Mary. uh, And that was constructed about about the 14th century. So it's kind kind of Gothic style there. So we're not talking about an ancient settlement, but one that is long established and which by the early 20th century was a very pleasant place to stay. Probably had a population of five to five and a half thousand, more or less. Uh, You've got your middle classes, you've got your technical and arts college there itself, uh, but you've also got a growing industrial population, which tend to be supporters of the SOE, the Partido Socialista Obrero Español, So they tend to be on the left wing. And like any emerging industrial centre, particularly in the north, that's where the football starts. That's where football comes in. So they have a number of of football teams, even though they've got a population of about 5,500. By the spring of 1937, because of the movement of refugees, that's gone up to about 7,500 to 7,000. It's also extremely important in the culture and the national identity of the Basque people in Euskadi. They have a, a kind of an unknown origin story. We're surrounded by, they're surrounded by Celts, which are the, uh, the, the Aboriginal people here in Spain, yet the Basque language itself has nothing in common, uh, linked to a certain extent with what is spoken in parts of Britain today, Welsh as well. Uh, And yet they have maintained that strong sense of national identity throughout the centuries, throughout possibly the millennia. Why is Guernica important? It has an oak tree. It has an oak tree. And in that oak tree, that was where the Basque nobles would sit with the, let's call them the Castilian monarchs, before we call them Spanish, from the Middle Ages. And swearing allegiance to the Castilian monarchs, however also saying that you also respect our identity as Basques and our own laws, which are not necessarily the same as yours. And they're, they're called the fueros, 
and that's a, has has a big impact today as well. So it literally is they gather around this oak tree and that's where they hammer out these agreements. And it's where all the Castilian monarchs, I think four or five, come in person to swear loyalty and accept loyalty from their Basque subjects. And by the time we get to the 18th century uh, or even before, it's called the Casa de Juntas, the House of the Meetings. And that's where uh, it's much more than a town council. Uh, but less than a national government. However, in this town, for whatever reason, and why this oak tree, no one's exactly sure, but from that 14th century, Guernica, with its 5,000 people, occupies and still does an incredibly important part in Basque culture. You can't disassociate the two. So what's going to happen, historically or not, justified, will have a huge resonance and how it's perceived. So we now have the scene set to what Franco is doing. We understand a little bit more about the town. But how are we getting to this point that the German Luftwaffe attacks? Well, there's a, so many threads, and it will all come down to one piece of geography, which I'll talk about at the end. Uh, the largest party, the one with the most influence, the one that is linked to the people in its deepest, most symbolic way, is the PNUB, which is the Partido Nacional Basco, the, the Basque National Party. And they have been, you know, like many other parties since the declaration of the Republic, they have been campaigning for greater autonomy and possibly for one day independence. They are actually as conservative socially and religious Catholic faith as Franco. You can't really shine a light through. Now, the methods that Franco is going to try and achieve that are very different from what the Partido Nacional Basco want to achieve. But they don't necessarily have a lot in common with not so much the far left, but just the left. Uh, they've seen the church's rights reduced. They may have... Uh, noises being made of greater autonomy from Madrid, from the Republic, but there's a whole social programme, the taking away of education from the church, which they're not necessarily agreed with. They're also middle class. They are the business leaders. They are the ones that are investing in industry, and the Basque country is an industrialised area. Uh, and the idea of paying... Uh, increased taxes to allow greater workers' participation in the decision-making process is not necessarily one which they like. So actually what they've been doing is negotiating secretly with the nationalists, but not with Franco. So one of Franco's associates, uh, General Mola. And General Mola is the organiser behind the coup. Uh, Franco is the one that takes the power, mainly because all the other rivals are dead. Not that he's killed them, there's been accidents, there's been executions, uh, but he is the leader, but it's Mola, General Mola, who is the organiser. He is a better tactician. He is a better military leader in the field than Franco. Uh, he's cleverer. He is more book learned than Franco would ever be. Not that Franco was stupid. Franco has an innate sense of survival and an innate sense of, if I think it and believe it, I will make it so. So, the PNV are not negotiating with Franco, they're negotiating with Mola. Mola will happily accept a, spa, a, a Basque declaration of neutrality, or we'll throw in our, our hat with you, just keep, you know, let us keep the, keep the fueros, let us keep our particular national identity, we're not going to de demand independence here. Uh, Mola, is, his game is not national cleansing that Franco wants. It's just basically, uh, I'll become head of the directory in Madrid and we'll set up a new political organisation. But in terms of renewal, OK, no communists, no anarchists, but there could be a left centre party. Franco will have none of that. He doesn't know what's going on. This is the thing. Franco's regime is not solid, but he's making it solid. Mola is one part in his bigger game. So Mola is trying to achieve something politically, which Franco says, well, if they're not going to agree, if they're not going to surrender to me, well, we will do it 
by military means. He's failed in Madrid. Uh, and so he begins to think, right, change of policy. And this is what Franco can do. He can take any setback and think of a solution. So we'll move the campaign north. We'll take the industrial heartland of the Basque country. We'll move towards to Catalonia, which is the other industrial heartland. And we'll cut off the Republic from France because we will control the frontier passes in the Pyrenees. Uh, so that's what's building up through shall we say, the new year in 1937 towards spring of 1937. Now, these negotiations keep on going. We have the Italians, we have the British, because the Basque, uh, the Partido Nacional Basco, they hope somehow they can convince the British government that the British Navy will ensure the maritime neutrality of the Basque country. Uh, well, Britain, for all its... Uh, again, shared conservative values, which they do with many of these Basque leaders, will have none of this. This is not part of their game plan. They do not want to become involved militarily in this, even though they've got large-scale investments. The people that do want to improve their investments there, funnily enough, are the Germans. They don't have a, a, a country that is rich in natural minerals. The Basque country is. So they're seeing it in terms of we're going to get involved in a world war. So we want access to iron ore. We want access to mercury. And that's what we're going to get from Spain. That's one reason why we're here. So Franco's plan is we are going to uh, attack in the Basque country. Now, here's what's interesting. and No one knows quite sure why. He doesn't reinforce his center again. Same thing that happened in Madrid. They underestimate their enemy. Now, did he do it on purpose? Because he kind of knows that Mola is up to something. Franco, however, has now created a block of support that he, Mola, cannot use in his favour. He's isolating Mola and a few supporters of his. He's got the Carlists. He's got the Falanges. He's got groups that have nothing in common except a hatred for the Republic to join him and accept him as leader and Mola has to accept him as leader. The offensive starts, and we're starting, I think, at the beginning of, would it be the, the beginning of March, I think it is. Uh, no, sorry, uh, we're starting at the end of March, uh, uh, the spring offensive in the Basque country. He hasn't reinforced the forces enough. The territory, the terrain up in the Basque country is hilly, and it's valleys, and it's mountainous. It's not designed for open warfare. The campaign is designed to last two weeks and basically capture Bilbao. Once, once Bilbao was captured, the biggest industrial city, that's it. That's the end of the story. Two weeks later, they've hardly made any progress whatsoever. The Basque forces are fighting in their own territory. They're fighting in their mountains. They know their territory. So they are stopping this attack. Mola is in charge of, this, of the nationalist forces. And he's lost face. And he's wanting a quick result. He's looking around at what are the resources that he's got. And what he's got up there is the Condor Legion and the Italian Air Force elements there as well. That's what he's got. Suddenly, his negotiations mean nothing to him. He can't get the Basques to agree politically. Then he will use bombing as a way to achieve what his ends are. You've also got kind of like a twin dark star around Mola. You've got von Richthofen, the cousin of Manfred from the First World War. And he is one of the chiefs of the Condor Legion. And he's come along thinking, uh, I've got a chance here to show what bombing can achieve. And they've already moved aircraft north. And basically it's now set up for the final part of the jigsaw. Because what happens is that although the Basques are holding out, and they're holding out well, the right flank collapses. And the right flank collapses, which is basically in front of Guernica. Uh, and you've got the left flank at the coast being ordered to pull back. Uh, and that's the moment when the nationalist forces want to stop Basque reinforcements arriving and to stop Basque units retreating. And when they look at the map, they're looking for bridges. 
And what they find in Guernica, which is near this collapsing front, is a bridge. And that's what brings us to Guernica. Guernica has a bridge called the Renteria. And it's on the outskirts of the town. It's just by the railway bridge. And that's what the nationalists see. And that's what von der Richthofen sees. And it's not just the bridge. The bridge is not enough. But what about if you destroy the town and make it impassable for Basque forces? So that's what's kind of brought us there. All those different elements all coalesce around a 30-metre bridge. Can you tell us what happened on that fateful day? Right. So what happens there on that day in April? Uh, The target is picked on that day. There is no conspiracy here. There is, although they recognise that Guernica, anyone that knows Spanish history or culture, knows that Guernica is an important target culturally. But it's not picked for that. That's a secondary consideration. So uh, on the day of the bombing, what we're looking at are the aircraft. You've got uh, three Italian bombers, SM-79s. They will be supported by 10 CR-32s, which will bring the fighter protection. So that's really the Italian component there. Uh, The Germans, they're trying out their Dornier 17. Uh, They want to use that or use that for reconnaissance. They've got two Heinkel 111s. The core of the force, of the bombing force, are 19 Junkers 52s. Uh, So that's the Iron Annies. You know, what in terms of what? We know from World War II, used for paratroopers, used for transport, but we forget they're actually being used as bombers. So they're going to provide the, the, the core of the bombing force. Apart from that, there's going to be some ME-109s flying fighter protection. Uh, you've also got some uh, Heinkel 51s, which are the biplane uh, fighters. But what they are also charged with from the beginning, this is part of the... German plan. The Italians have already said that they don't think that uh, they should be bombing the town itself. They should be avoiding that. However, what they do both agree on is the importance of basically machine uh, machine gunning anybody that's moving on the roads. So although we've got fighter protection, there is no real anti-aircraft defense there. There are no fighter squadrons to take on these bombers. They are going to be used to attack civilians. So that's to sort of set the scene of the planes that are on the uh, 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 airfields that morning uh, in April. Uh, they'll be carrying, the Germans will be carrying up to 250 kilo bombs. This is what Richthofen is very keen to find out. The Italians will be carrying the 50 kilo bombs. They were notorious for, ca- for carrying a small caliber bomb load, which will actually come to Britain's favour in the defence of Malta. Uh, uh, But what is also different compared to the other bombing raids that have happened in Spain, a third of the bomb load will actually be incendiaries. This is what Richthofen really wants to find out. What will happen if you drop a lot of incendiaries? Now, the Basque authorities know that the front is collapsing. They know the power of the nationalist air forces that has been supplied by Germany and being supplied by Italy. So they're already taking measures. Uh, they stop the market, which should have been taking place that day. They're posting sentries in the entrance to the town to stop people coming in. And that's actually reckoned to save a great deal of, of lives. Uh, they're preparing the air raid shelters and, and so on. So that's happening during the morning and afternoon. Uh, at 4.30 p.m., the Dornier 17 appears over the town. Uh, it's obviously seen very, very quickly. The alarm is, is, is rung. Uh, it comes in low, north to south. Uh, it's heading for the bridge. Uh, it drops three 250-kilo bombs near the bridge, misses them, uh, but causes damage to other buildings uh, uh, around. At that stage, people either begin to leave the town to head to the countryside or to actually look for air raid shelters. So that's at 4.30 p.m. Shortly after that, uh, the SM-79s, the Italian bombers, appear, three of them. And again, they're flying from north to south, uh, following the river. Now, the Italians 
always drop bombs from about 15,000 feet. They never come in lower than that, even though there's no anti-aircraft fire. They dropped 36 50-kilo bombs, and they missed the bridge. Uh, there's damage to some of the buildings around there, and we're talking about uh, uh, the first deaths. Now, at 5.30 p.m., so that's an hour after the appearance of the Dornier 17, uh, Heinkel 111 appears, uh, probably as an observer. Then you have another Heinkel 111 appearing, being supported by Italian fighters, and again, comes in, drops 650 kilo bombs on the bridge, misses and damages the surrounding building. Now remember, the reason that Guernica has been picked is because it has a bridge. So far, every attack on that bridge has failed. Now, by 6.30 p.m., the main part of the raid has started. This is what's important to remember. We've got one part, which is we just have to hit that bridge. And so far, they've had no success. The, the 19 Junkers 52s coming in in groups of three at a time, again, north to south, they have one target, and that's a target picked by von Richthofen, and that's to hit the town. That's what they have to do. And they start unloading uh, 250 kilo bombs. However, they're also carrying a third of the bomb load is actually one kilogram incendiaries. The first bombs that are dropped are 250 kilos, and they're high explosive. And they basically blow the roofs off buildings. That's what they're designed to do. What Richthofen wants to find out is what happens if you follow up with a raid of incendiaries. Most of the houses built uh, in Guernica are built either of wood or of wooden galleries. Uh, the roofs are made of wood. And very quick, quickly, what the witnesses see are these large columns of white, intense white smoke billowing up out of these roofless buildings, uh, followed by flames, uh, towers of flames. In fact, what they talk about, one of the witnesses, is a rain of fire. This is what happens. It's a rain of fire. Uh, and what you see in the after raid reports, the German pilots couldn't see anything. Even on a scale which we think is very small compared to anything that happens in World War II, uh, the whole town is obscured by thick smoke. So as, a, as the planes come in, they have a rough area to bomb. This is not precision bombing. The bridge is no longer the target. So uh, that takes place at half past six. They leave. People start to leave the shelter as they begin to feel safer that the raid is over. People begin to cross the railway lines. That's mentioned by quite a few of the, of the witnesses. And that's when the Messerschmitts and the Italian fighters come back and they dive low and they open fire and they are targeting civilians. They know, they know it. They know what they're doing. This is the strange thing. There was no big plan to use Guernica as an example to the rest of Spain. However, effectively, on the ground, that's what the commanders had decided. These pilots were not acting spontaneously. This was part of the uh, plan, and they caused large-scale uh, civilian casualties. The last plane leaves at 7.40. Uh, the raid is over. The fighters have gone. Funnily enough, and this is kind of get forgotten, I mean... What has just happened is horrific. The fire brigade comes within an hour from Bilbao. It's only 20 kilometres away. They get the fire brigade in. Uh, the town architect, who is very much a, 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 a hero, he takes charge of the rescue operations. Uh, they realise that all the water mains have been burst. Uh, so plan B, we get the pumps out and we go down to the river and we start putting out the fires. He's the one that says, no, we've lost the centre of Guernica. It's not there. Uh, there's no point trying to use our resources there. And he takes them uh, into the west of the town, which is relatively un undamaged. Uh, and actually there, they're able to do some real good and to save some extremely um, important buildings. So I kind of, I feel that what I've given here is uh, a historically accurate 
description, summary of what's happened in the bombing raid. However, we have to remember that there are approximately between five and a half to 7,000 people in that town. And in the period of from half past four to about half past seven, they have three hours of unremitting terror. That, that, that I, I find very hard to get my head around to be able to put myself into, into that position. This was something new, not the first bombing raids, but it's the use of incendiaries. And this get, comes up again and again in all the witness accounts it are the flames. It's the, it's the sense of helplessness that you can't do anything here. You're watching your whole town, it seems, going up in flames. And the flames carry on uh, well into the early hours of, of the morning. And why? In the end, because Guernica had a bridge. That was why. I mean, I've seen the painting and listening to some of the accounts. I mean, this is horrific. This, this is a war crime. Yes, yes. You can't, you can't define it any other way. It's a deliberate targeting of civilians. And Richthofen, he, he is simply the embodiment of a growing body of opinion uh, in the world that bomber strength can win wars. He, he was very much part of the Euro bomber project in the early 30s. Germany has to build a four bomber, uh, sorry, a, a four engine bomber capable of striking deep into Russia. The other body says, no, we have a tactical air force that supports the army. He eventually leaves uh, his, his post because he sees that they've lost. Uh, uh, but he sees in Spain a way to put his theory into action. Uh, and so you have this man that you can't have a- anything but disgust for, coldly calculating the deaths of these civilians, yet we have the uncomfortable fact to face that he's representing a larger body of opinion that is prepared to put its principles into action. Uh, and it happens to be Guernica. So what was the outcome of this attack? Uh, well, I'll take the easy one first. Militarily, it's a complete failure. Uh, it achieves nothing whatsoever. The, the, the following day, the bridge is there. Uh, Richthofen's plan was, you don't just bomb the communications, bridge, uh, railway. You, you, you create such destruction that you can't actually pass troops through it. Uh, that, that doesn't happen. I, I don't think Guernica forms either a part of the Basque nationalist withdrawal or uh, any plan for their advance. There's, it simply doesn't figure. So militarily, an absolute resounding failure, completely, from the Germans and the Italians. In a way, the Italians have the better excuse. Their bomb sites were rubbish. Uh, they were bombed from 15,000 feet. They're using 50 kilogram bombs. But you had uh, a, a, a concentrated German bomber attack at a lower altitude with no anti-aircraft fire, and they couldn't hit a bridge. So that's the military side of things. You look at the civilian side. There's 492 buildings in the town. 271 are affected by the raid. Now, of that 271, 71% are destroyed, completely destroyed, flattened, burnt out to a shell. Uh, 7% are badly damaged, which means they can't be lived in. Uh, 22% are lightly damaged, which could, which is obviously structural. Uh, they've lost roofs. They've got uh, walls coming down. In fact, of that, those 271 houses, only 1% are actually left intact. It's basically the historical centre is completely flattened. The town council, the railway station, the church, the church of St. John, the cinema. Uh, there's a sport in Pais Basso called Fronton, which is a handball game. Uh, the, the, their fronton stadium, covered stadium, larger than the world, it's destroyed. 
the abattoir, the marketplace, the technical college, the courts, all of those are destroyed. And funnily enough, any of the cultural historical landmarks, the things that people were aware of that mattered in, a, in terms of what they represent, the Casa de Juntas, the, the Garnica Oak, undamaged, nothing, nothing whatsoever. So even if you want to say it's a cynical plan to strike at the heart of, of Basque nationalism, it fails. Now, when you look at, at, at the deaths, uh, press estimates, 600 to 800. Uh, however, serious historical studies in the last decades asking questions as, why are there no mass graves? Why are there no evidence of, of, of mass graves? Uh, why are there no uh, lists of names of, of, of the dead, of those numbers? Have questioned that. And what we've come down to is about 200 of it, which again, we think, well, given the nightmare that's going to fall on Europe, 200, that's almost collateral damage. If you look at, at it as a percentage, it's 4%, and that's exactly the same as Hamburg in 1943. So when you put it in context like that, I mean, one death is one death too many, but it's exactly the same percentage as the bombing of Hamburg. You don't get anything worse until the firestorms of Tokyo 44, 45. So what it achieves is really the obliteration of an entire town. Not the first time that bombing's taken place. And there are parts of the town that survive. But the level of destruction through the use of high explosive and incendiaries is immense. But militarily, as I said, it's, it's a complete failure. The media, especially the foreign media, must have reacted some way. Very much so, and very strongly. Uh, and given the fact that you know, we're living in a 24-hour, seven days a week news environment where everything is being updated constantly, and we think that's very new. Well, actually, the bombing takes place, I think, on the 26th of April. By the 27th, 28th, you've already got news reports. Now, I think what's different here is whether on purpose or not, the censorship in the Basque country was not as strong as elsewhere in Spain, or people felt that it should be known what's happened to this cultural, historical, national centre of Basque identity. Whereas I mentioned before, I think that in, in Madrid, there was always that conflict between the uh, Spanish authorities in the city and the, and the foreign press. Here, it seems that the foreign, res, uh, foreign press very quickly got to the uh, town because it was near the front. The foreign journalists, French particularly and British, are following the Basque forces back. They see the fires at night. They see them burning and they know something's happened. So, for example, uh, French newspapers, uh, Cessoir, 28th of April, 800 victims in Guernica, ancient Basque capital. Uh, Cessoir, 29th of April, in the ruins of Guernica, German-Italian planes dropped thousands of bombs on the historic Basque town, then fighter aircraft machine gun its inhabitants. Numerable women and innumerable children lost buried under their burning homes. And that's just the headlines. We're not onto the article yet. Uh, L'Humanité, 28th of April, Thousands of incendiary bombs dropped on Guernica by Hitler and Mussolini's planes. The town of Guernica reduced to ashes. The number of dead and injured cannot be calculated. Uh, L'Humanité, 29th of April. Not even five buildings remain standing in Guernica. So the image that's been given out to the world is that this historic cultural centre of Basque nationalism has been raised to the ground. And it's this emphasis on incendiaries, on fire, on the machine gunning of civilians. And this is what's going around the world. I think probably the most the more famous of the of the journalists is George Steer of the Times, uh, a noted war journalist of, of the time. And he starts off by saying Guernica, the most ancient town of the Basques, and the centre of their cultural tradition was completely destroyed yesterday afternoon by insurgent air raiders. Now, this is the this is the I think what makes the difference. He says in his like second paragraph, at 2 a.m. today, 
When I visited the town, the whole of it was a horrible sight, flaming from end to end. He's making it clear he was there. Whereas in Madrid, you would tend to be four or five miles distant from the front line and being given binoculars. Uh, the bombing raids were using high explosive. They weren't using incendiaries. Madrid was not on fire. Whereas he's walked into at night after having left the front line, a burning town. He, all he can see is destruction. And you just look at the geography. He's coming in from the east where the worst of the damage has taken place. So his first reaction is to see these burning shells of buildings. He doesn't see the west of the town, which is not as badly damaged. He then goes on to say the object of the bombardment was seemingly the, the demoralization of the civil population and the destruction of the cradle of the Basque race. It's as if everybody's primed to react to this atrocity carried out, not just against humanity, but again against the identity of a European nation. They're not just being seen as part of Spain, they're actually being seen as part, as a, as a race, a national group with a, an identity of their own. And that image of wanton, violent, complete, utter destruction of the kind of heart and soul of a people is one that I think resonates to this very day. On the one hand, we've got journalists that are there uh, who are reporting what they're seeing, but they're also drawing interpretations from what they're seeing that, in a way, the historical research in the last few decades, because remember, uh, uh, up to the death of Franco and a bit beyond, you could not question the official version of the destruction of Guernica. Uh, that they're giving a, a different perspective on it. Well, I'm guessing this is going to lead to, to our next question or my next comment, which is uh, how does Picasso get involved in all of this? Because he does, doesn't he? He does. He does. He's living in Paris. He's not actually lived in Spain since he's left Barcelona as, as a young man. He's made visits to come back. Yes, he has. Uh, but he's not lived here. Uh, he's lived through the First World War. He's lived in a city that you could not have avoided uh, the, the, the awful consequences of industrial warfare, the, the crippled, the wounded, the, the mutilated. Yet he, he, he never artistically, from what I know, took any interest in that, what he saw. Uh, he is, by the 1930s, the most famous artist in the world. Uh, not everyone is going to like what he does, but no one can deny the impact that he's had. The Republic has tried for years to get him on board and to have him do work that shows the Republic in a good light. Funnily enough, the Falangists have also been doing the same thing as well. Uh, Primo de Rivera actually meets him one day and says, look, don't deal with the government, uh, deal with us. We'll look after you better, we'll make sure you get paid. Uh, so you've got the extreme right talking to a guy on the left, but he's Picasso, and that's a catch. Now, he's always refused to get involved in politics in that way, although he's a man of the left, but he has agreed finally in 36, 37, to produce a work for the Spanish Republic to be shown in the exposition of modern life in Paris that's to be used, shown in spring, summer of 1937. He reads the newspapers. Now, remember, I was saying from the 26th of April to the 28th, it's frontline news. Now, it's interesting to think that he's not joined the Communist Party yet, but he's certainly a fellow traveller. Now, if he's reading L'Humanité, L'Humanité, unlike the other newspapers, they publish photographs. Uh, and you look at them, and those are distressing photographs of dead women. So he's seen this. Now, that sparks it for him. He's been doing sketches already. Uh, they're, they're, they're very normal, shall we say. Uh, they're what you'd expect. Uh, there's a clenched fist in the center holding up a, a, a sickle. There are abstract cubist images scattered around. But there's no center to it. The scale's there, the size there. But given that he's only got a month to get this ready, he's nowhere ready. But 
whatever these reports spark in him, uh, and I think personally it's it's the scale of destruction and it's the role of fire. It's the role of using fire as a destructive power. That's my own feeling. Uh, but he starts on two sketches. He has them done by, I think, the 7th, 8th of May. And basically, uh, the difference is from sketch one, he has a soldier lying in the foreground, uh, dead, uh, on the ground. Uh, and by the second sketch, that's gone. But all the elements are there. The weeping woman, the role of light, the, ro- the role of flames, the distressed horse, uh, the passive bull, uh, all of those elements are there. Uh, and in the next four weeks, on a scale that is hard to imagine, but remember, this is a man that has absorbed all the artistic traditions of Spain from uh, Durbaran, Goya, Velázquez. He's not intimidated by scale. He's happy to work in that. He's in his Paris studio. Uh, his uh, partner of the time, well, she's his, his lover at the time, artist in her own right, Dora Mar. She takes a series of photographs and it just comes together. He makes some... Uh, he, he adapts as he, go, as he goes on. He takes out a few elements. But essentially, from that second sketch, in the period of just over four weeks, he completes possibly the most well-known, recognised work of art of the 20th century, that whatever your views are in art, you cannot deny the role and the impact that it's had. So it's, it's ready to go into the exposition. I completely agree. I'm I'm just looking at it now again. This is, I am not Picasso's biggest fan. I, I really do not like his style of artwork at all. But this is so dark and painful when mm-hmm. you look at it. So if people haven't seen this painting, I would highly advise you to go and Google it now. It is just haunting, absolutely haunting. And it has created such an impact throughout. And I think that's, interesting to think about that impact that it's had because the painting this is my other argument that you and i see now it's not the same one that people saw in 1937 Uh, it's it's been an incredibly chameleon like work of art uh because it has represented what people wish to see you've pointed out the darkness it's emotional visceral pain that it generates people had never seen this before it was completely new at a time as you can say google this and we can look at it and dissect it and and look at why it affects us so 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 strongly nobody was prepared for it in 37 and when it was exhibited in the spanish pavilion it's got a sculpture by alexander calder in front a kinetic sculpture and beside it, it's got the cafeteria. We forget that it's just then it was part of something bigger. And then in front of it, it's got the Russian Soviet pavilion. Behind it, it's got the Nazi pavilion. Down the road, it's got the British pavilion. And this is the Spanish pavilion, which the Republic is trying to show that in this horror and using that horror, the forces of good can still create something as stunning as Guernica. Uh, And then from there, it takes on another life because it's actually brought over to the UK. Uh, It becomes a property of the Spanish Republic, of of the Spanish state. Uh, It is transferred over to Britain. It's shown in London. It's shown in Manchester and I think possibly Leeds. Uh, uh, it's criticised by the Soviet spy, Anthony Blunt, who, apart from appearing to be uh, a conservative fuddy-duddy, is simply towing the party line. Soviets hated it, absolutely hated this abstract, bourgeois, self-indulgent nonsense, until 1942, when they're attacked by the forces of Nazi Germany. It has an impact in Britain. Uh, it's in the White Chapel, it's at the White Chapel Gallery. Uh, and one of the most potent images, it's not a photograph, but 
uh, you pay your money to go in uh, to see it, but they're to try and help the people in Spain, particularly in Barcelona, as the front is collapsing in 38, 39, you bring in a pair of boots, which will then be sent on. And the description is sent on to uh, Barcelona. Uh, it's a description of women's working class, working class women's boots that have been brought in and left row after row underneath and in front of pa Pablo Picasso's Guernica. That is a fundamental, I think, moment of transformation when it becomes, a, it represents something more than the sum of the parts. But when it goes to America, that's when, that's the that's the Guernica that we know, I think, because there it falls into what is a increasingly confident society searching for its own means of expression and finds it in Pablo Picasso's Guernica. On the one hand, you have the right wing that want to burn it, but on the other hand, you've got people who are just ready to see a new world, a modern world, a world with all its warts, one that can be represented in this dynamic, dark way. And one of the artists that uh, I think is worth talking about is actually Lee Krasner, who I think even then was married to Jackson Pollock. She talks about seeing Guernica for the first time. Uh, uh, and I think it was in New York, because it ends up in the Museum of Modern Art there. Uh, and she says, I ran out. I walked three times around the block before I went back to look at it. Now, you look at her own artwork, and you've got a before and after. People have talked about Jackson Pollock a lot. The, uh, he becomes obsessed with Picasso. He tries to paint like Picasso. And eventually, he moves beyond that and into the abstract work that he's famous for today. But without that transition from uh, some pretty mediocre, folklore-looking kinds of paintings in the 30s, he would never have got to that worldwide status as a great artist. But you look at Lee Krasner, and I argue you've got a better artist. You look at her still lives before Guernica, uh, colour, shape, form, it's all there, but it's got no centre. She never tries to paint like Picasso. But from that experience, she said, I ran out and walked three times around the block before I went back in. And you look at uh, her works from the mid to late 40s, stunning in their originality, their use of colour, their use of rhythm, their use of pattern. Uh, it's To me, it's more dynamic than Jackson Pollock's own work. There's an attention to detail that surely must come from what she saw in Picasso's Guernica, where every element is controlled almost so, so effortlessly. So just in that short decade, to me, that painting has transformed again and will transform again when it goes to the UN, will transform again when Franco Spain wants it back in the 60s, will transform again when post-Franco Spain in the 70s didn't want it back, will transform again when Pablo's children didn't want to bring it back to Spain and will transform again when it's brought back to Madrid and then transform again, where you go and see it now in the art gallery Reina Sofia here in Madrid, where the impact is, again, I would argue, what you would have had looking at a religious painting uh, in any time up to the 18th century. It has that same physical impact on you, the size of it and its content matter as well. So it's it's... <sighs> And then you get to the point where you trace it all the way back to what happened on the 26th of April, 1937, because German Air Force planners in the Luftwaffe saw on the maps that Guernica had a bridge. And that, that is where life becomes somewhat mind-blowing. Colin, that was absolutely incredible. I mean, this is a podcast I've been dying to get on to History Hack for a really long time because this painting, it's even impacted me at certain points of my life. So thank you so much for joining Not us. Not at all. To us about a this. pleasure as always. Join us tomorrow for a double header.
In the morning, you can catch up with Zach and Marcus on their programme Sharpshooters, which deals with the Napoleonic era. They will be talking about guerrilla warfare. Don't miss that one. And then in the afternoon, Charlotte White returns for another slice of Hollywood history. And this time, it's the love affair between Clark Gable and Carol Lombard. So don't miss out on that one. Don't forget that we do exist on Patreon as History Hack and on Patreon as well, which is Podbean's own version. Uh, Elena and I have had massive fun doing this in 2020, uh, but life's going to change quite a lot next year and we're going to actually have to go and earn a living, etc. If we want to keep up the regularity that we've been bringing you and the kind of guests that we've been bringing you and the workload, then we will need your help. So uh, if you join... There's going to be incentives for joining on either of those platforms. We're revamping ourselves on both of them. So don't forget to go in. You can do as little as a dollar a month and it all goes towards keeping up History Hack as regular as we've been able to bring it to you this year. We are now on YouTube. We are posting all of our new episodes on there and we have our own channel and we are gradually posting all of the back episodes because we have been made aware of the fact that you can only find the last hundred on some platforms. So you can go and listen to your heart's content and laugh at the cartoons and have a great time. So do go over there and subscribe.